and you will be helped as we think about our Savior's loving care by having your Bible open, turning to Psalm 23, Psalm 23, and if you're using one of the black hardback Bibles in the seat in front of you, you'll find that on page 458, 458, we're turning to Psalm 23 this evening to be our meditation and to be our concern as we turn our eyes to our Lord and continue the meditation we've already begun in song. Psalm 23, it is written, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come and gather as you have gathered your flock in this congregation. We've come to, by your shepherding care, we've come to be shepherded by you through your Son as your Spirit speaks your word again to us. We pray that each of your sheep would hear and know the voice of their Savior, would follow Him, would cling to Him, and would know the greatness of Your care and love for them. Father, we pray that any lost sheep here this evening would turn and hear and think of the great shepherd and master they may have in Your Son, Jesus, and with what confidence we may go through life knowing your presence and your power is for us as you love us in Jesus. Father, have all our ears open to hear your word, to be both comforted and corrected, and be with the sheep who expounds your word, to be faithful and careful. May you build your church and gather your flock. In Christ's name, amen. The simple beauty and profundity of Psalm 23 have made it the most familiar psalm, certainly in the Psalter, probably the most familiar chapter in the entire Bible. To attempt to expound it, as one writer put it, feels like vandalism. You don't even want to touch it. Ruin the profundity and the simplicity of this great psalm. But on the other hand, it's our familiarity with Psalm 23, and many of us probably have it committed to memory, Our familiarity with this psalm can become our greatest hindrance really to plumbing the depths and understanding the breadth of what God is communicating to us here through the pen of David. It is profound revelation. And while shepherding is the primary and first metaphor, it's not just a simple illustration that David is plucking out from his culture and that those around him would certainly understood as shepherding was certainly a lot more common then as it is now in Sacramento. David is not just plucking from his experience or his culture. There are actually at least two layers of background here that make Psalm 23 shine with an even greater brilliance than we may have ever seen before. The first is God's rescue of his people in the Exodus. God bringing his people out centuries before David penned this psalm from slavery in Egypt. After their liberation, Moses sang in Exodus 15 after Pharaoh's army had finally been trounced in the Red Sea. Moses' song in Exodus 15 verse 13 includes this, You, Lord, have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed, 
You have guided them by your strength to your holy, and the ESV translated abode, but it's the same word as pasture here. You have led, guided them to your holy pasture. Psalm 23 here, he leads, verse 2 and verse 3, to green pastures. And the word translated mercy that we're familiar with, the traditional translation in verse 6, is really better translated steadfast love, as your footnote will show. God has led by his steadfast love to his pasture. Then before Israel entered the land of promise, entered the land of Canaan, which God had promised them, Moses declared in Deuteronomy 2, verse 7, these 40 years the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. Or you can translate that, you have not wanted. It's the same verbiage as verse 1, I shall not want. And verse 4, you are with me. When Jeremiah wanted to describe the wilderness that Israel was led through after their liberation, in Jeremiah 2, verse 6, he described that wilderness as a land of deep darkness. Or you could translate that, the same language as verse 4, the shadow of death. The wilderness that Israel wandered through, that God led them through, was the shadow of death. In Psalm 78, when the psalmist is describing how God provided for his people in that shadow of death in the wilderness, in verse 19 of Psalm 78, he declares, you spread a table in the wilderness, just like verse 5, you prepare a table before me. There's actually more we could continue, but suffice that to say, Psalm 23 is laden with echoes of the Exodus. It's laden with echoes of God's delivering work for his people. For God to be Israel's shepherd, when Israelites thought of God as shepherd, they thought about God rescuing them from the bondage of slavery and bringing them to dwell with him, to worship him, to be in his land as he promised. But there's another layer. There's a second layer to Psalm 23 in background, and that is to be a shepherd in Israel Just like many of similar cultures in the ancient Near East around them, shepherding had royal overtones. You referred to your king as a shepherd. It referred to national leadership. That's why throughout the Bible and the Old Testament, God will refer to the leaders of Israel as as shepherds. He calls the judges who delivered Israel before the kings were installed, those I commanded to shepherd my people. And in particular, David, the high point high point of Israel's kingship and royalty. When David was anointed as king over Israel in 2 Samuel 5, verse 2, the northern tribes declared, you have led out and brought in Israel, and the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel. When Israelites were asked who who was their shepherd, they pointed to David in Jerusalem, their king. Our king is our shepherd. When Israel thought of shepherds, they thought of national deliverance. They thought of kings over armies. They thought of protecting their boundaries and their nation. They thought of the Lord breaking Pharaoh's bondage and leading them out of slavery. When they thought of shepherding, they thought of warriors and kings and deliverance and might, leading for them as a corporate community in national deliverance. And what all that means by way of background is that the startling and most surprising and shocking word in this entire psalm is the shortest in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. The most shocking word in Psalm 23 is the word my. My shepherd. David's not speaking nationally. David's not speaking as a community. He's speaking individually and personally. The Lord who broke the bondage of slavery, the Lord who installs kings of his people, shepherds me. He leads me personally. And what then that also means, the other second startling surprise of Psalm 23, a psalm of who? David. Is David the brave warrior? David the national hero? David the great king? is just a sheep. He's a sheep before his God. 
no less than any other Israelite, the king is a sheep. The shepherd of Israel is a member of God's flock, wholly dependent on the Lord's guidance. And God leads him personally, intimately, and individually delivers him. Of course, it begs the question, where is the Lord leading him? Where is the Lord shepherding him personally? He led Israel out of slavery to worship him. David led Israel out from under the Philistines so that they could serve him and worship him without hindrance. And David is confident in Psalm 23, therefore, that the Lord leads him to himself. He uses the same root word two times in this psalm. It's hindered by translation. Verse 3 and verse 6. He restores. And verse 6, I shall dwell. And if you notice your footnote there, the verb dwell is really implied. It's not the literal verb. It's the verb return. David uses the same root word that means return at its basic meaning. Verse 3, the Lord restores. He returns. He revives my soul to him. And surely I shall return to the house of the Lord. Why did God lead Israel out of bondage? To worship him. Why did God install David over his people? That they could worship him. Why does the shepherd lead each individual sheep? That they would know him and worship him. What the Holy Spirit says to us in Psalm 23 is that if you know this shepherd you may be confident that he leads you back to himself. If you know the great shepherd, you may have absolute confidence he leads you to himself and brings you to him. And what I want to observe in this psalm are three sources of our confidence in his leading. In verses 1 to 3, we'll see God's provision for the journey, how he provides In verses 4 and 5, we'll see the Lord's presence in anxiety, how he is present. And lastly, in verse 6, the Lord's pursuit into eternity, how God sovereignly pursues and shapes his people. Well, let's look at our first source of confidence in his shepherding. In verses 1 to 3, God's provision for the journey, how he provides. With the Lord as his shepherd, I shall not want. He doesn't mean you will never have desires anymore. Really, the NIV get better gets the sense of this, I shall not be in want. Or we could translate it as this Hebrew phrase is translated several times in the Old Testament, I lack nothing. There's nothing I need that is withheld. I have all that I need. And that's not a small thing when you go back to the arid, dry wilderness of Judea with sparse grass, few sources of water. Shepherds often led their flocks on arduous journeys to supply their needs and give them what they needed. And so David paints the shepherd's care with these phrases. He leads me to green pastures where I can lie down. Sheep don't eat lying down. For a sheep to lie down, it means it's content. It has enough. There's been more than enough, and there's enough green grass that you can just lie on it and wait content. It's a picture of contentment and satisfaction, of abundance, of provision. Or even also the still waters, or you could translate that, you see the footnote, waters of rest. Waters you can rest by, waters that are calm, where, there's no, uh, where you're secure and the sheep can safely drink and rest in the shepherd's provision. But the emphasis here in verse 2, is how the Lord is the one who causes them. He is the one who provides. Notice, He makes me lie down. He leads me beside still waters. All the provision lies in the shepherd's power. All of the provision comes from Him. He is the decisive influence. He is the decisive cause. The Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. When the shepherd of Israel saw his need, he looked to the Lord to provide it and said, the Lord will withhold nothing that I need from me. That shows us really one of the subtle cautions of Psalm 23. 
There's a subtle caution here. For abundance and rest, Israel looked to their shepherd, and it wasn't to be David. It was to be the Lord. David is just a sheep who looks to the Lord. The Lord is your real shepherd. And so we are rightly, subtly cautioned about looking to anyone or exalting anyone to provide what only the Lord provides. We could even consider the roles of pastors, which if you know, pastor is just a synonym for shepherd. It just means shepherd. But we can look to no pastor for only what our shepherd provides. That's one reason why I think it's unwise to use titles like senior pastor. Because in the scriptures, the great shepherd, Hebrews 13.20, the chief shepherd, 1 Peter 5.4, is a position that's already filled by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our shepherd, and every one of us is only a sheep. Even those of us who have the title of shepherd as our role before our name. It's just under shepherd. We are but fundamentally sheep before we are anything else. Your shepherd, beloved, is Christ. It is the Lord, no man. The subtle caution is only look to him. And so David says, I look to the Lord and he provides. And he fills it in in verse 3 and briefly lifts from the shepherd metaphor just a bit to draw us into the Lord's great provision Verse 3, he restores my soul, which implies already what David is going to go to into verse 4, that there are times when his soul is distant and far and fearful. There's darkness that needs to be restored, needs to be returned. Or you could translate that, and really I think a better translation would be revived, brought back to life. And the revival of his soul leads to, end of verse 3, leading him down paths of righteousness. Or you could translate that right paths. God's right paths, the paths that safely get you to your destination, the paths that get you to him. Restoration, revival, is always reviving to God's ways, God's rules, God's word, God's path of righteousness, his right paths. And why does God lead us to his path of righteousness? That we would be so proud of ourselves? No, end of verse 3. For his name's sake, it's for his glory, that the world might look at the flock of the Lord and recognize the greatness of their shepherd by how he leads them, by the way they live, by how they walk according to his word, how they see his word not as a burden that shackles them, but as a great caring shepherd leading them on the right path of a precarious journey that needs skillful and wise pointing out through his word. The sheep of the Lord receive his word as his wise guidance that leads them on the way they ought to live. And so verse 3 really is a picture of the reviving work that God does through his word and bringing his people to his word. And there's a precursor, I believe, to this in verse 3, just a couple psalms earlier, in Psalm 19. Psalm 19, that great psalm where David unpacks, really, the glory of God's revelation, both in all he's made and in his word. And in verse 7, David writes, the law of the Lord is perfect, and he says, same word as verse 3, reviving the soul. The Lord's word restores the soul. It revives the soul. He renews my soul, leading me in his word. His word gives me life. The life he gives lead me to his word, that he would be glorified in the paths I take. Whom do you turn when your soul is ailing, when you are dry, when you are distant, when you are lacking rest? Isn't it tragic that often in the arid places, the last one we go to is the one who could ever give us life, the great shepherd, the only God who can revive our soul. We can think that we're too dry to turn to God. We can think 
that we're too distant now to go to him. But he's the only one that can supply our need. He's the only one who gives life, who gives rest, who gives abundance to those in need, those who are lacking, those who are desperate. And he does so in his paths by his word. When you don't desire God, who do you go to? You go to God. And you tell him you don't desire him. And you tell him to supply your need. You go to the shepherd who leads his sheep. All our need, all our provision, all our restoration is provided by him. The second ground of confidence we see beginning in verse 4 is God's presence in anxiety. God's presence when we're anxious. And really, verses 4 and 5 are the center of the psalm, or we might say the emphasis, the great point. And it's clear in the logic, where is a shepherd's care most proven? When we're lying around in the sheepfold? No. When we're walking through danger, where the sheep face the most danger. And for shepherds to find ample grass in the Judean wilderness, to find ample grass and water, they would often have to cut through deep wadis. They're called wadis. Really what they are, they're narrow canyons. They're narrow canyons cut through the dry rock of the desert in the Judean wilderness. And at their bottom, these narrow canyons, the light is blocked out. The heat is stifling. And the light is blocked out. And in the darkness, there can be many predators hiding for sheep wandering through there, or traps. And if you remember just a little bit of David's biography, you'll recall that those canyons and those cracks in the rocks of the wadis, that's where David fled to when he was fleeing from Saul, when he was fleeing later from his rebellious son Absalom, was to hide in these canyons. This is the danger of the wilderness, the danger of the shadow of death. The traditional translation, shadow of death, essentially takes the Hebrew word and splits it in two. It's a compound word of death and shadow. It might be just better to translate it as deep darkness. That's how there's other places in your Bible, like I mentioned Jeremiah 2.6, where it's translated deep darkness. This word is used four other times in the Psalms. And every time shadow of darkness, shadow of death or deep darkness is used, it's in a context describing affliction, describing bondage, describing distress, describing the wilderness and God's discipline. It refers to the, that hopelessness, that sense that the fears are going to triumph, that sense that anxieties will become fixed reality. And it's important to note here, as, as David is describing this fear, the valley of the shadow of death is not irrational. If you're a sheep traveling through that valley, you have real danger. There are real predators looking for you. And if your shepherd lacks skill or care, you're done. He's not talking about an irrational phobia. But yet, in the midst of real danger, verse 4, I will fear no evil. Because he fears, more than anything, the shepherd who is with him. And do you notice then the profound shift in verses 4 and 5 from the rest of the psalm. Notice David goes from verses 1 to 3, the he who leads me, to verses 4 and 5, the you who is with me. You notice that shift in pronouns? In the deep darkness, the shepherd is no longer him who is ahead of me, but the you who is right beside me. You are with me right alongside the sheep. And from that intimate position, the sheep is able to find comfort, end of verse 4, reassurance by seeing the shepherd's rod dangling off his belt. The rod is the club. It was a mace-like object used to defend the sheep against wolves and other predators. It was a weapon. And he's able to see as the shepherd walks along him, his staff, that crook, the shepherd's crook, to guide and to keep the sheep along the right path while the light is dim. And every sight the sheep takes while he's alongside him of the shepherd's rod and the shepherd's staff reminds him of exactly who is with him, exactly the powers and the provision that is beside him, and that there is in this valley no evil that has power greater than the shepherd who is with him. 
There's nothing he can face that the shepherd can't overcome. And so with such presence in verse 5, David now shifts the metaphor. And he leaves off being a sheep. And there's a sense here where verse 5 is sort of building emotion. And where David is overwhelmed with the shepherd's presence, so he shifted the metaphor and says, it's like being a guest of a king. You, verse 5, prepare a table before me, even when I'm surrounded by enemies. To be God's guest at his table is an intimate image. To invite someone into your home and to provide for them means that there's no more hostility, there's no enmity, that there's familial relation, that there's intimate welcome. And as a host, you take on the responsibility of the protection and safety of your guests. They're yours, you're responsible for them. So God welcomes him into his table and says, as it were, I provide you not only this food, but I provide your protection now. You're, you're with me, you're in my tent, you're in my household. And as his host, God demonstrates lavish care. He, verse 5, anoints them with oil that cleans the grime and the dirt off of the journey. His provision is more than bountiful. His cup overflows. Your cup never runs dry at the table of the Lord. It's always filled. And with the Lord's nurture and care, he's even demonstrating to all who watch, all these enemies around him, whose side he's really on. He's on the side of his sheep. And he's demonstrating who's in his flock. Those who are in his flock are the ones who are being provided for, the ones who are being strengthened in the valley. Those in the deep darkness, in weakness who have power, those are God's sheep because he prepares a table for them even when they're surrounded by enemies. Now this imagery of God's presence in Psalm 23 conveys many things, but there's at least three important reminders here that this imagery of God's presence conveys. And the first is that darkness is real. The darkness is real. Even in this psalm that exalts confidence and the loving care of our God, there is no romantic, naive, naive view of life. In other words, knowing God does not mean that troubles and dangers and pains are removed. Far from it. We will walk through a world that is still in rebellion, that is not yet redeemed, and we are now, as Israel was before the promised land, sojourning in the wilderness, in the wilderness outside of God's final presence. There are enemies. There will be dangers. God's true sheep will face anxieties, despair, and even death itself, and they must travel through it. The dangers are real. But the second reminder we quickly add, the Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. The hardest part of being in that darkened valley surrounded by enemies is feeling alone, feeling by yourself. But if you are one of his sheep, you are not alone, ever. And we must not neglect every instance of God's presence, every reminder of Him with us, the rod that defends us, the staff that guides us, and a table where we fellowship with Him and are reminded whose family we really belong to. Sinclair Ferguson, I believe, had a helpful observation when he observed that Christ's rod and Christ's staff are His cross and His word defeating death and the devil in the cross and guiding us to him through his word. And I'd maybe just add to that that the table of communion is spread at the Lord's Supper when we gather in true fellowship as a church together around him and we remember whose family we belong to. David's life testifies, as does every other saint, that God is present with his people, and God is often present through his people. We won't take the time, but if we were to go back through Second Samuel and David's biography, we would see how often David was provided for by the Lord through others. In fact, he often had 
table spread for him when his enemies were just down the road. The table that God spreads in the wilderness is often spread through the love and care of his people. Or we might say that the table that God spreads for his sheep may just be in your kitchen through your care and your encouragement and your prayers for fellow saints as they're traversing through the valley. God always spreads a table for his people and he often does it through his people as they care for each other. The Lord is with us. And the third reminder, maybe the most important, the Lord led us to the valley. The Lord has led us to the valley. Who leads the whole way? Who leads to the green pastures? Who leads to the still waters? So who must be leading into the valley of the shadow of death? It's the shepherd. The shepherd leads. There's a million reasons we could give why he leads into that valley. But at least one of the important ones that stands out in this psalm is it because there in the darkness, intimacy is forged with him. It's there in that valley when God in the third person becomes you in the second person who are with me. The God that I have thought about often will remain just a thought in the green pastures. And it's not until the valley of the shadow of death that we realize he is a person who is present with me now. Tim Keller, I think, wisely observed, sometimes when it seems like God is killing us, he's actually bringing us to life. Leading us to the valley of death seems like our destruction, but it is there that we recognize the true character and the true person of our shepherd and that he is with us. God leads us to the valley of death to bring us into greater life, to know him, to spend time observing his rod and his staff, and to know him. If we only laid in green pastures, would we constantly think of our shepherd? Probably not. I think Arthur Bennett, in his prayer that begins the wonderful collection, Valley of Vision, nailed it when he wrote, let me learn that the valley is the place of vision. It's the valley where I see the shepherd with greatest clarity. It is times of grief, times of sorrow, times of physical sickness, times of despair. It is in times of relational catastrophe. It is in the valley that I remember the Lord is with me. And so I must always remember it is here the Lord has led me. He has brought me here for his purposes. And my shepherd knows what he is doing. There must be good he has in this. And that's the confidence with which David ends this psalm. As we see the third ground of confidence in verse 6, God's pursuit into eternity. God's pursuit to eternity. With assurance, David concludes, surely goodness and mercy, or as we've already said, better would be steadfast love, God's covenant promise and his loyal commitment to be with his people. Surely your goodness and your commitment to me shall follow me. But that word follow we keep there because it's traditional, but it's too weak. The Hebrew verb here is aggressive. It means pursuit or even chase. Surely your goodness and your love chase me, pursue me. David here is describing a vigorous, purposeful, intentional pursuit by God's goodness and love. It is to say, David is saying, that every place I find myself is where God's love has chased me to. It is where he has pursued me. His love is shaping my life. He is the shepherd who guides me through it. His love and goodness are designing me and molding me. Our great confidence as his sheep is not that we have pursued God, though we must pursue him. Our great confidence is not that we have pursued God, but that he pursues us continually, constantly. 
with the Lord as my shepherd, the journey of my life must be goodness, must be love, whatever path it travels. And it must be because every journey is defined by its destination. And what is David's destination? What journey are we on with the Lord? To where is he pursuing us? End of verse 6. The house of the Lord. As already mentioned, you have a footnote there. That word dwell is implied. What David writes here is, I will return to the house of the Lord. That is, from the wilderness, from being outside his presence, he will bring me back just as he brought Israel out of bondage to the land to be with him, just as he delivered his people out from the Philistines to build a temple to be with him, God will bring me personally to be with him forever, to commune with him, to know him. God will bring all his sheep who live east of Eden and live in the wilderness to return to him. That is the end of the pilgrimage. The final sheepfold For God's sheep is to be with him, to be forever with him, to delight in his abundance, to intimately experience his beauty, to enjoy direct access to him where we're told elsewhere in the Psalms there are pleasures forevermore, for eternity. The shepherd is pursuing me and leading me to himself forever. David knew the shepherd of God's people as his shepherd, personally. And so the question that Psalm 23 is intended to provoke by our reading it, that is intended for you to ask, is do you know this shepherd? Do you know David's shepherd, the shepherd? When Jesus Christ declared, I am the good shepherd. He wasn't just pulling an illustration from his culture. He was reaching back into God's word and saying something about who he was, who he is. Israel's shepherd, Yahweh, has come to be with us and for us. He's not just David's greater son. He's David's shepherd who became a man. And how does the good shepherd shepherd us? How does Christ shepherd us? He said, I am the good shepherd, John 10, verse 11. And right after that, he said, I lay down my life for the sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. His rod is defeating death and the devil and our flesh by the cross. And we can be in the flock of God and belong to him because our shepherd, the great shepherd, came to be a lamb. The shepherd stepped out of heaven to become a lamb on earth and to lay down his life and suffer for us, receiving our judgment that we deserve on the cross and rising again that we would have forgiveness and righteousness and peace with God by trusting Him and by turning to Him. In the wilderness, turn to the shepherd. His name is Jesus Christ. Trust in Him. He's the good shepherd. How does He shepherd us? Just a few statements later in John 10, he said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. We follow his voice as he speaks to us in his word. We hear him, and we know that is my shepherd, and we follow him. And if we are following Him, trusting Him, we can be confident of His care, confident of our security, confident there is no power in the deep darkness that can snatch us from His hand. He is the good and great shepherd with skill and purpose who leads us to Himself. Where does the shepherd lead us? 
John saw in Revelation 7, verse 17. The lamb in the midst of the throne has become their shepherd. He will give them springs of the waters of life. The good shepherd leads us to still waters, the springs of living water, where eternity will be spent in his presence. Christ, the good shepherd, has come to bring us to himself and skillfully guides all who hear his voice back to him, where there will never again be a dark valley, where there be endless grass and sufficient water, and we will have our shepherd and king forever. The good shepherd, have you heard his voice? Do you follow him? Do you trust him? Be confident of his care. If you want this kind of confidence in Psalm 23, if you are in Christ, it is yours. It is yours to have in faith. By his provision, we confess in verse 1, I shall not want. By his presence, we confess in verse 4, I will fear no evil. And by his sovereign, eternal pursuit of us, we confess in verse 6, I shall return and dwell in his house forever. The shepherd leads us to him. Let's pray. Father, our great confidence is simply that your son Jesus is our shepherd the good shepherd who has come to give his life for his sheep and to lead us back to you. We pray that everyone in this place this evening, Father, would hear his voice. They would know him and trust him. We pray you would speak to all of your flock, gather them to yourself, and remind us all of the confidence we have in you. Make, Father, your people and your church confident, courageous, and assured for your glory because we know you are our shepherd. And do it all, Father, for your name's sake, for you are worthy of all praise into eternity. We ask this, our Father, in the name of the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Amen.